Good evening and welcome again to Celtic Connections. Irish Classical Theatre reaching out to you, our friends, subscribers, donors and colleagues. This is the third and final session of Irish poetry, but definitely not the last episode of Celtic Connections, because we'll be with you right through the summer, every Friday evening. Next time, a little sneak peek backstage at the Irish Classical Theatre. But now some Irish poetry. Not really poetry, so... (laughs) Now, they say that God created whiskey to prevent the Irish from taking over the world. I'm not sure if that's true, but there's some truth in it. Brendan Bean, the great Dublin writer, reversed the usual phrase that drink is the curse of the working classes and turned it into work is the curse of the drinking classes. There's a famous story about Brendan when he gave up the drink and he was in Canada doing a lecture tour and he was doing a late night television show and the host said when he saw that he was absolutely legless, perlatic, stupefied, drunk, he said, but Mr. Bean, I thought you'd given up drink. And Brendan replied, ah yes, but you see, when I arrived in Toronto airport, I saw this huge banner and it said, drink Canada dry. So I took them at their word. (laughs) Be that as it may, here's a little anonymous ditty about the health benefits of drinking lots of liquor. And it's called Poor Beasts. The horse and mule live 30 years and nothing know of wines and beers. The golden sheep at 20 die and never taste of scotch or rye. The cow drinks water by the ton, and at 18 is mostly done. The dog at 15 cashes in, without the aid of rum or gin. The cat in milk and water soaks, and then in 12 short years it croaks. The modest, sober, bone-dry hen lays eggs for nogs, and then dies at 10. All animals are strictly dry. They sinless live and swiftly die. But sinful, ginful, rum-soaked men survive for three score years and 10. And some of them, a very few, stay pickled till they're 92. (laughs) So much for liquor. I'm going to revert now to, again, one of my favourite poets, Patrick Kavanagh. This is a little poem, which is better known as a song, actually, Raglan Road. It's a love story about Kavanagh's first great love, lost love, and maybe a little tinge of recovery. It's better known, Raglan Road, as a song, but I'm not going to offend you by singing tonight. If Lauren Shine was here with me, I'd have him sing for you. My parents, when they heard me sing for the first time, they sent me to mime school in Paris. So that'll give you some idea of the suffering I'm making sure you don't have to undergo tonight. Raglan Road, Patrick Cabinet. On Raglan Road, on an autumn day, I met her first. I knew that her dark hair would weave a snare that I might one day rule. I saw the danger, yet I walked along the enchanted way and I said, let grief be a fallen leaf at the dawning of the day. On Grafton Street in November, we tripped lightly along the ledge of the deep ravine where can be seen the worth of passion's pledge. The queen of hearts still making tarts and I not making hay. I loved too much, and by such and such is happiness thrown away. I gave her the gifts of the mind. I gave her the secret sign that's known to the artists, who've known the true gods of sound and stone and word and tint. I did not stint, for I gave her poems to say, with her own name there and her own dark hair, like clouds over fields of May. On a quiet street where old ghosts meet, 
I see her walking now, away from me so hurriedly. My reason must allow that I had wooed, not as I should, a creature made of clay. When the angel woos the clay, he'd lose his wings at the dawn of day. Now, a winner of the Patrick Kavanagh Prize for Poetry was a contemporary poet called Paul Durkin. Now, (laughs) Paul Durkin has a lot going for him. Firstly, he's from Dublin, so he's automatically superior, if you were listening to my last session. Secondly, he married an O'Neill, so he's almost royalty. And thirdly, he's a great poet. Well, at least he's original, he's fresh, he's humorous, and he always takes a tangential view on life. This is set in Tully No, tiny village, and it's called Tully No, Tete Tete in the parish priest's parlour. And it's really a dialogue between a grieving widow and her local parish priest. Ah, he was a grand man. He was. He fell out of a train going to Sligo. He did. He thought he was going to the lavatory. He did. In fact, he stepped out of the rear door of the train. He did. God, he must have got an awful fright. He did. He saw that it wasn't a lavatory at all. He did. He saw that it was the railway tracks going away from him. He did. I wonder if... Ah, but he was a grand man. He was. He had the most expensive Toyota you can buy. He had. Well, it was only beautiful. It was. He used to have an Audi. He had. As a matter of fact, he had two Audis. He had. And then he had an Avenger. He had. And then he had a Volvo. He had. In the beginning, he had a lot of Vauxes. He had. He was a great man for the Vauxes. He was. Did he once have an escort? He had not. He was the son of a doctor. He had. He had a Morris Minor too. He had. He had a sister, a hairdresser in Kilmallock. He had. He had another sister, a hairdresser in Ballybunion. He had. He was put in a coffin, which was put in his father's cart. He was. His lady wife sat on top of the coffin, driving the donkey. She did. Ah, but he was a grand man. He was. He was a grand man. Good night, Father. Good night, Mary. Now, in 1969, the Troubles began in Northern Ireland. And I remember, as a young man, travelling to a theatre festival in Donegal, and early 70s, I think it was, and um, we had to pass through Northern Ireland briefly, So we avoided the usual, um, you know, border crossings where we knew there'd be soldiers and barbed wire in the works. So we took a little side road and we came around a bend and suddenly this floodlight hit the car and we looked up and there was a soldier, a young British soldier, standing in the middle of the road with an automatic uh, rifle. And he made a gesture to roll the window down. I did. And this rifle came through the window pointed at my forehead and he asked a few questions. We answered correctly. He let us go. But as I drove down the road towards Donegal, I thought, you know, well, firstly, the fear of having, you know, a muzzle pointed at you and how close you came to death, but also how awful it must be to live in your own country, invaded by soldiers from a foreign power. And I think This is what Patrick Galvin deals with. And Patrick Galvin was from the South, but this is very much set in the North. It's called Letter to a British Soldier on Irish Soil. Soldier, you did not ask to come here. We know that. 
You obey orders. We know that. You have a wife, a sweetheart, a mother. We know that. And you have children. We know that too. But soldier, where you stand, there's death. Where you walk, there's a burning wound. Where you sleep, there is no peace. And the earth heaves through a nightmare of blood. Soldier, when you die, the dogs will bury you. When you came to this land, you said you came to understand. Soldier, we're tired of your understanding, tired of British soups on Irish soil, tired of your knock upon the door, tired of the rifle butt on the head, tired of the jails, the gas, the beatings and dark corners. Soldier, we're tired of the peace you bring to Irish bones. Tired of the bombs exploding in our homes. Tired of the rubble growing on our streets. Tired of the deaths of our friends. Tired of the tears and the funerals. Those endless, endless funerals. Soldier, when you came to this land, you said you came to understand. Is this your understanding? We dream here. We dream that this land is our land. That one day Catholic and Protestant, believer and non-believer will stand here and dream as Irishmen. We dream of a green land without death. A new silence descending. A silence of peace. And this dream, we dream, soldier, without you. That is our understanding. Go home, soldier. Your presence here destroys the air. Your smile disfigures us. Go home, soldier, before we send you home. Dead. Now, 1916 is the most famous day in Irish history because that's when the Easter Rebellion happened in the General Post Office in O'Connell Street, then Sackville Street, the main street in Dublin, Ireland. There was a raggle-taggle band of amateur soldiers, merchants, writers, teachers, poets, led by a 36-year-old Patrick Pierce, And the Easter Rebellion led to the independence movement and ultimately a free Ireland, well, almost free, 26 of the 32 counties. And Patrick Pierce has become an icon, a hero and a martyr in Irish history because when the Helga gunboat came up the River Liffey and they shelled the post office, the, the raggle taggle band of rebels, they surrendered, but instead of being taken as prisoners of war, they were brought to Kilmainham jail and one by one, they were shot up against the wall. A couple of years ago, on an Irish classical tour, we went to Kilmainham jail and it was very moving to be in the spot where this happened. This was written by Patrick Pierce, obviously before the 1916 revolution. It's called the Wayfarer. And in it, he almost foresees his own death. The beauty of the world hath made me sad. This beauty that will pass. Sometimes my heart had shaken with great joy to see a leaping squirrel in a tree or a red ladybird upon a stalk or little rabbits in a field at evening lit by a slanting sun, or some green hill where shadows drifted by, some quiet hill where mountain man had sown and soon would reap near to the gate of heaven, or children with bare feet upon the sands of some ebbed sea are playing on the streets of little towns in Connacht things young and happy. And then my heart hath told me these will pass. 
will pass and change, will die and be no more. Things bright and green, things young and happy. And I have gone upon my way. Sorrowful. Sorry to end on such a dark note, but it is Irish poetry after all. Um, see you next week. A peek behind the scenes at Irish classical. Same Irish time, same Irish channel. God bless.